What's up, everybody? Thanks for coming out. Welcome, everybody, online and all our locations. So great to have you. I'm Jared. If you happen to be a guest, I have the joy of going to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace, and it's such a joy to have you. As you see, we are in a series on Revelation, and we have a lot to do today. So let me pray, and we'll just dig in. Lord, thank you for all who are here, and pray in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit open your word to our hearts. Open our hearts to your word. We gather in vain without you. So we plead this in Jesus' name, amen. What, is, what comes to mind when I say the word worship? I'm thinking you're, you may think singing, praying, maybe attending a church building, but let me give you a different understanding of it. So for example, uh, from Alabama, we were big college football, moved here. I don't think there's a such thing as college football up here. I've kind of given up on it. It's all NFL. And my boys, of course, have grown up here in New York, so they're NFL fans, particularly my son Titus. He's a Giants fan. Oh, Lord, pray for us, all right? Uh, and me, me as well. I, I love the Giants along with him. And there's something, too, uh, being a Giants fan or a sports fan. Even if you're not a sports fan, I'm coming for you later, all right? So just, just stay with me for a moment. Something interesting when it comes to that. So you have your team, and you read about your team. You learn the numbers of the players on the team and their names, and maybe you read their stats, and you listen to the coach and what he's saying and the game plan, and then you listen to ESPN as whatever, what's everybody else saying about the team. And then you want to watch the game. And so the game's on Sunday. You begin to rearrange your entire Sunday to be able to watch the game. You know where you're going to sit to watch the game. You're going to spend money to have food and enjoy the food while you watch the game. Especially if you get to go to the game. You probably rearrange your entire month <laughs> or week to get to go to this game. And you get to the game. You have your seat. You can't wait. You sit in your seat. You see the players come out, and you spend money to enjoy, enjoy the food and such while you're there as well, as well. And whether you're at the game watching the game or you're sitting on the sofa watching the game on the television, as you focus on it, something happens in our bodies. We begin to respond. It could be that we jump up. It could be that we shout. It could be that we clap our hands. It could be that we weep. It could be that we plead. You know what that's called? Worship. It's focusing on something bigger than us that creates a response out of us. Now, if you're not a sports fan, I don't know if you're this fan either way, but I'll just throw it out there, these two words, uh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> now, listen. Listen to me. I, I really, I love Taylor Swift. I do. But can we all please just calm down a little bit? All right. But I don't know if you've seen pictures and video of her concerts or Coldplay's concerts or even Elvis Presley concerts. What happens? Comes out on stage. People clap. People raise their arms. People shout. People sing the songs. Some people weep. Some people pass out, y'all. You know what that's called? <laughs> Worship. It's focusing on something bigger than you, and it creates a response out of you. Do you give that kind of worship to Jesus? Because ain't nobody I just described dying for you, pouring out their blood for you, making you right with your eternal creator. Don't you under, listen to this. Don't you understand the worth of your soul? You know what soul means? More. We, our souls are built for eternity. We're built to go after someone, something bigger than ourselves, better than ourselves. It's just something in our humanity, but it's so warped that we settle for sports teams and sports stars and celebrities. And I'm not knocking that. I'm just trying to get you to understand the worth of your soul and how we long to worship when you're created to worship him. You're made for God. He's the only one that can satisfy your soul. Because what you got to understand is this, God does not need your praise. He's gifted you praise to him 
Because if you don't praise him, you're going to praise something so much more less, like a sports team and, and, a, and a musician and, and art or your job or your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your money. Your soul has such great worth, it's built for God. And all, all of that kind of worship I described in the here and now, that's breadcrumbs to who you're made for and the worship you're made for. It's whispers of Eden that is within you. So we go to heaven here. Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5 is a walk through heaven to see what worship is all about and what we'll be a part of in heaven. So know this. Heaven is not about the end times. Heaven's about God. Heaven's about Christ Jesus and who he is and what he's done for you and for me. So let's take a walk through heaven. First, you've got to understand here that you are to worship God for he is God. Even if he was a tyrant, he would be worthy of your worship because he's God. But we see so much more, his love for us, even displayed here in heaven. So let's take a journey. Verse 1. John of Patmos, we've been with him for the last three chapters. He saw a vision of Jesus, Jesus speaking to the seven churches. Now we're coming out of that vision, and John says this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me, like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place. So remember the word like. You're going to see a lot of that. Like this. It was like that. It was like this. It's him trying to find human language for infinite, eternal realities. We see here heaven with a door standing open. Listen, you better know the one who has the keys to that door, or you don't get in. And his name is Jesus, who holds the keys of Hades and death, the seen and the unseen world. Unless you are born again, says Jesus, you will not walk through that door. It will be closed. Are you born again? Verse 2, at once, he says, I was in the spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven and one seated on that throne. I love the image that the throne is standing in heaven is because when everything is shaken in your life, there's something not shaken but stands strong and true. When Jubilee, our youngest daughter, went through her brain trauma and we didn't know if she would live through it, we didn't know if she would come out of it, we didn't know what she'd be like coming out of it, when we were shaken to the core, we knew this, there's a throne and it stands and there's one seated on the throne who's in control. I love that he's seated. It doesn't mean he's running around the throne. It doesn't mean he's panicking and pacing about the throne. He's not chewing his nails, wondering what he's gonna do about your life or mine or the world. He's seated on the throne. He's sovereign. He's in control of it all and of you and your life. As we've learned, John Piper said, God is up to 10,000 things in your life and you know about two of them. God is up to millions of things in the world, in our culture and society today, and we might know a handful of them. He's sovereign. He's in control. He's authority, and he has authority over your life, whether you like it or not. And here's why. He authored your life. He holds your breath in his hands. He keeps molecules on point so that you can think rightly and live your life and so forth. He owns us, owns you. He is God, God is what we find here in heaven. And just in case we miss it, know this, God is under no obligation to make sense to you. God is under no obligation to explain himself and his ways to you. For he is God and God will be God and we must worship him in his sovereign power, rule, authority for who he is. And, of course, what he will do and what he has done. Verse 3, and he sat there. He who sat there, this is God the Father, was like, had the appearance of Jasper, Carnelian, uh, and around the throne was a rainbow and had the appearance of an emerald. So, in a sense, you're seeing God in HD, God in high definition that John is communicating to us. And it's, it's like this. I don't know if you've ever seen a beautiful sunset and you want to, you or the moon in the sky, it's a big, bright, full moon, and you pull out your camera, and you take a picture of it, and then you look at it. Never does it justice, does it? It just looks like a dot on, on a piece of fabric or something. 
So this is John going after human language with et- and, and trying to grasp eternal images. And so he's, I'm not going to define what each stone means. They're just precious stones with brilliant colors. And he's saying it was almost too much to look at. It was so beautiful. It was so glorious. When I looked at him, all I saw was beauty and glory and colors. That's heaven. There are going to be colors there you've never seen. And they're going to be brand new colors you'll see forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And it says there's this rainbow around his throne, a whole rainbow. We only get to see a half rainbow here as God has declared his faithfulness and his mercy to us in these days. But when we're in heaven, it will be a full rainbow of this glorious emerald green of some sort that shows God's serenity and peace and also his power for us, for you, and for me. And with that, we see that God is pure light and will bring light to us unlike we've seen. And it's just not like this light brown light or white light. It is color. It is glory. And that same kind of light he can bring into your life even now. But that is heaven. Revelation 4.4. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Clothed in white garments. That means those who have been born again and saved and they have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb. Sinless in his presence. Now golden crowns has to do with crowns that believers will receive in terms of their faithfulness on the earth. But who are these 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones? Here's what I believe. I think they're 12 and 12. They're 12 uh, patriarchs of, of the Jewish nation. There were 12 tribes of Israel. I believe these are redeemed in Christ. And so they represent that. And then on this side has to do with the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles who God used to speak to the non-Gen, non-Jewish world. That's us, the, the non-Gentiles. And they come together to form all of God's people. The church is what we're, ho- what we're seeing there and what we're going to be a part of in those days. Verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal these thunders, these rumblings. So I remember a couple of years ago, it came a really, really bad storm where we were living and we have a big, had a big trampoline. And I just happened, something caught my eye outside the window and I just happened to look over. Our huge trampoline was flipping over through the yard. So me thought, I'm going to run out there and grab it. So I ran out there trying to keep it from blowing in the neighbor's yard. And it didn't take me long. Once I heard the thunder hit, I turned and said, trampoline, do your thing. I ran right back inside <laughs> And I just thought that's nothing compared to what that will be with God. You know, Mount Sinai in Genesis where, I'm sorry, in Exodus where God descended on Mount Sinai to appear to the people in his glory. It shook Mount Sinai with rumblings and thunder. And they, 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 they moved back for fear that they would die because of that glory. This is something we see in heaven. These seven torches, spirits of God, that's the Holy Spirit. The number seven has to do with wholeness and completeness of heaven. We see here the Holy Spirit in the New Testament was the Holy Spirit of comfort and encouragement. Here, seven torches of fire means he's part of bringing judgment on the earth. We see here the sea of glass and crystal, which means that there's this vast expanse between this glorious God and, and between him and creation. Now, just pause there. Have you seen, when's the last time you saw God like that? And, and, and would you put your mind and your heart upon him and respond to him for his glory? You got to do the hard work of going there for who he is. It's understanding this chiefly. You're not the center of the universe. He is. Heaven's about him, not about you. We just get to be a part of it when our faith is in Christ and we're born again. So that's Revelation chapter 4. And we continue and we see one of the reasons God is worshiped as God is because he's holy. Verse 6. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. The fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them, with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So the question is, who are these four living creatures? It's most likely this. It's creatures that, remember it said they were like this. They represent all creation. 
So for example, the creature that was like the lion representing wildlife, the creature like the ox rep representing domestic wild animal, I'm sorry, domestic animal life, the creature like the human was, has to do with humanity and intelligence. And then the creature like the flying e eagle had to do with the, the flying creatures. And it's just a way of saying God governs it all. It's his creation. And it talks about these angels that, that have six wings and they cry out, holy, holy, holy. You go all the way to Isaiah chapter six and you see this unfold with a vision of Isaiah. Isaiah is there and he sees a vision of God in his glory. He's in the temple in the sense like the universe. And there are these angels with six wings and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. And think of, think of a jet breaking the sound barrier and how when it breaks the sound bar barrier, if you've ever heard this, it sets off car alarms. You, you feel this concussion in your chest and you dip just for no reason. You just dip down because it's so powerful. Think every cry of these angels, angels is holy, boom, holy, boom, holy, boom is the Lord God Almighty breaking the sound barrier. And he's so white, hot, holy that there has to be an expanse between us and him. And with these angels' wings, it says in Isaiah, with two wings, they cover their faces. With two wings, they cover their feet. And with two wings, they fly. He's so holy that sinless angels have to cover their faces and their feet. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy. They don't have a worship leader with a guitar going, come on, angels, put your hands up and praise him. Come on, angels. Really put your heart into it now, angels. Stand up, angels. Let's... No, -uh. they focused and they responded by breaking the sound barrier as they cried out to him. Welcome to heaven. These eyes penetrating intelligence. Oh, and by the way, they cry out, holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And it says they do this day and night without ceasing. Can we all just be honest right now? Doesn't that sound a little boring? Am I, am I the pastor and I'm the only one that thinks that? <laughs> Let's just be honest. Day, night, without ceasing? Here's what you got to understand. Every time they say holy is because they saw something brand new about God. A surprise, holy, and a new surprise about God, holy, and a new surprise about God, holy, and they see something brand new, a surprise about God, unceasing, day and night, and their response is just more worship. Have you ever thought of heaven that way? Heaven is you will see something brand new about God, surprise, every moment, unceasing, day and night, forever ever. Hmm. This week I've been listening to this worship song a friend shared with me. And it's one of those songs that you, that you find or it's gifted to you and it's brand new and it, it's so moving that you're, you're, you're almost going into an ugly cry if you don't, if you don't watch it because it, it catches you in the, in the chest and it gives you the lump and that's what it will be forever. There will be a brand new song. There will be a brand newness every second forever, and it will be more than we can stand heaven because he's holy. He's holy. But he's also God creator. They worship him as creator, which struck me here. Why not worship God as glorious or all-powerful or all-knowing? Why creator? Because creation is so present, and there is a God who took nothing and made something. He's God. Watch. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy, listen, you better get used to saying worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. And here's why. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Glory of creation. Nobody's debating evolution in heaven, y'all. God did it. Case closed. And so they worship him about creation. And so when our creation, what do you see when you look around? 
Think of it this way. When I watch some of these athletes after basketball games, superstar athletes, they walk up, they hug, and then they take off their jerseys and sign them for one another and they trade. And I think that's creation. God's given us his jersey. God signed the jersey. He signed creation. It's his autograph. Do you take time to go, he did this? And when you see that sunset and when you walk through the woods and you see that sight or you go to Montana or wherever you go and you see something that just absolutely takes your breath away, that's God's little signature on that. But there is something about creation that's wrong too, isn't it? Creation can be very ugly too. It can be very broken. Romans 8 talks about that, that creation groans underneath the curse of sin and slavery. It also says in Romans 8, our bodies groan underneath the curse of sin. Wildfires, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. That's not God. That's sin and nature groaning underneath, wanting to be freed to what was originally meant to be when God created it. So you groan, the worth of your soul. Do you see it again? You groan. You groan perhaps with depression or heart disease or diabetes or, or name it. It's your body groaning because you're not meant for this world. So God is in motion to bring our groaning to an end, to be with him in heaven forever where there's a brand new world and brand new wholeness, and we have him as our light and as our love. Revelation chapter four, worship. And you would think, boy, that's as good as it gets. Mm -mm, we're just getting warmed up. There's Revelation chapter five. <laughs> Revelation chapter four, you worship God for God, for he is holy, holy and he is creator. Now in Revelation chapter five, we worship Christ for he is worthy. Verse one, then I saw in the right hand of him, God the Father, who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. So we've gone from a throne to this scroll. In the right hand of God the Father is this scroll showing us he holds earth and creation and humanity and destiny in the palm of his hand. It's written here within, within it and on the back. It was unheard of in that day for scrolls to be written on the back. And so the scroll would roll out this way and roll toward the middle. So for it to be on the back as well means this is something detailed. This is something cosmically important. And there's seven seals across this scroll, meaning what's within it is sacred. It's, and it's something in it that's settled. It's personal, meaning when it's opened and all that is to follow, there is none who can say, as the psalmist says, God, what have you done? For he is God. And then the seals will be broken. That's next week and following. They will be broken. And from when they are broken, events will unfold to bring human history to its end. Revelation 5.2. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy, worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No one is able to open the scroll. Now, don't think of this in terms of a jar of salsa where you, you pick up the jar of salsa and I can't get it off. Would you see if you can get that off? And you, you kind of pass it around. I can't, and you turn. Is that what's happening in heaven? That everybody's trying to pull the seals off like a jar of salsa and no one's strong enough to do it. It has nothing to do with strength. I mean, after all, this is a mighty angel with a booming voice that worships God. And he's saying, there's no opening this scroll. So it's not about strength to open the scroll. It's about who is worthy to open the scroll. The scroll, who is worthy to this title deed of the earth, to open it and then to carry out what's within that scroll. Verse four, John, listen to this response. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to even look into it. Listen, everything is writing on this scroll. And so John, weeping loudly, that literally means with convulsive wailing sobs. 
because he knows if this scroll is not opened, all is ruined. You know what that means? All this suffering in your life, meaningless. Loss in your life, meaningless. Unless there's one who can open this scroll. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The line of the tribe of Judah, it points to the one, the Messiah, who would come out of that tribe, this Jewish Messiah. Then it points to the root of David, meaning out of David's dynasty would come this Messiah. And he is here, he is there, and he has conquered, meaning he has conquered the grave. Jesus wipes tears, y'all. He's conquered the grave. He is our eternal champion. Without Jesus, only weeping. With Jesus, weeping goes to worship. As we see it here, even in heaven. And just when you think it can't get any better from Revelation chapter 4, how can it get any better? Oh, it gets better. Because someone takes center stage. Verse 6, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. So there's this moment where... John has been told the lion is there, but when he looks, he doesn't see a lion. He sees a, a, a lamb, and it's a lamb that's been slain, literally cutthroat, and the blood pouring out. It shows Christ Jesus, the one who conquered the grave and rose from the grave, who still has his scars for what he did for you and me when he died on the cross. Put it this way. If you go to the Old Testament, when God delivered his people out from Egypt, when he was going to send the death angel, he told his people, take a lamb, slaughter the lamb, because without, the, without blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, there's no life. Slaughter the perfect lamb, and then take the blood and put it over the doorpost, and then the death angel will pass over you. In the same way today, when you place your faith in Christ, who conquered the grave and rose again, his blood covers you, and eternal death passes over you. This is what heaven is celebrating right here. And this is a lamb that's slain. And a slain lamb, I wouldn't think, would be standing. But it is standing, showing that Jesus was slain on the cross on our behalf, but he was resurrected. And he stands there as the resurrected king, still bearing the scars for what he's done for us. And these seven horns and spirits, all that is to mean he's all powerful. He's, a, he's almighty. He is God, the son of God. Slain. See, this is why no other religion saves. No spirituality saves. Only Jesus saves. He's the Lamb who was slain and saved you. Verse 7 And he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of the Father who was seated on the throne. This is astonishing. No one's even been able to look at this scroll. And the Father gives it to him, meaning the Father approves of gifting this. And in Hebrews 1, God the Father calls God the Son God. And in so doing this, it shows the Father's love for you and for me that there was one whom he gave and one who went for us to the cross to die and was raised from the grave, who can open the scrolls, the love of the Father that has done that through Christ so that our souls can have more, that the souls can have him and with him forever and forevermore. So Jesus here takes the scroll and takes control of human history as it will unfold, controlling your destiny and the destiny of reality. And then here comes a rumbling of worship about Jesus. Verse 8, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the four elders fell down before the lamb, mm, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. What a moment. What a moment. We're still seeing that we're going to see something brand new about the Father, about the Son, and about the Holy Spirit forever. So much so that it is going to overwhelm us that we're going to throw whatever we have at his feet and we're going to fall down before his face. This praise here, this falling down, that means awe. This harp has to do with joy and gladness that you won't be able to handle in the bodies you have right now. 
You're, you're going to be given a whole different body to be able to take this joy and this laughter and this gladness. Prayer is being the aroma of heaven. And now that Jesus is center stage, it's now in this moment that heaven loses its mind first song of heaven. And they sang a new song saying, worthy, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign forever and ever on the earth. What a glory. Think how personal that's going to be. If you knew in the, we were talking about this backstage. The, the, there's a place where Jesus goes on this Mount of Transfiguration and Peter, James, and John, the disciples are with him. And Jesus is transformed into glory. And it knocked them back. And what they said was this, we want to stay here with you, Jesus. We've seen something about you that we don't want to go back to our old lives. We want to be with you. That's heaven. It's, it's when we're there, we go, I just want to be with you. I just want to be beside you. I just want to see you. And I want to see you in your glory, Jesus. So that's the first song as heaven loses its mind. And then heaven loses its mind with the first shouts we see in heaven. For he redeems and he reigns. And they celebrate and say, John says, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. That's just billions, all right? Saying, saying with a shout, with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb who was slain, count them seven, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing, complete praise. You know, I hear people and influencers and Christians and they say, you know, well, or they call themselves Christians. You know, Jesus, he, he's just a good man. He was a good teacher. He was a good role model. You know, he went to the cross and is a great example of how to love your enemies. He died on the cross for us. Are you kidding me? The angels know Jesus best. And they're crying out. They're not going, good teacher, good teacher. They're saying, power and majesty and glory be to you, O Christ, forever and ever and ever. And why is he receiving it? Doesn't he already receive it in heaven? He does. But he hasn't yet received it fully on earth or from hell but it's coming. We got Revelation 22 that's coming. And think of this. There's no song in hell. The music ends. Hell, instead of singing, is weeping. Hell, instead of singing, is gnashing of teeth forever. And any shouts is shouts. They've been separated from God. Let this not be you. Let's find ourselves right here with him in heaven. And then finally, at the end, just like if you're at a concert or you're at a football game and this section of the crowd stands up and they begin to shout and yell and scream and cheer and it begins to pick up and it starts circling around the stadium or the arena. That's exactly what we're finding in heaven right now because it says praise went with the four living creatures. They're praising. Then from the four living creatures, he went to the 24 elders. Now they're praising. Then it went from four living creatures to 24 elders to billions of angels. And they're praising. Now it goes from four living creatures to 24 elders, to billions of angels, to this. And I heard every creature, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Whew. Boy. You know, I got to ask. These are big truths. But maybe for you it's this. Have you been looking for someone worthy in your life to make you feel accepted or loved or wanted or valued? Your search is over. Are you looking for something more 
something bigger, something better. Oh, your search is over. His name is Jesus. He is worthy of your worship. Let's pray together. Oh, God. I feel so woefully, woefully short of bringing the glory I feel in my gut out of this passage for you. And so I pray for every heart, every soul, and the sound of my voice. I pray your Holy Spirit has brought light and glory and awe to their soul. You are worthy, O Lord, of all praise and honor and glory and power. Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one whom before all of heaven loses its mind in singing and shouting, God, help us, help our unbelief to worship you with our voices, with our lives, with our weeping, with our clapping, with our standing, with our kneeling. You are worthy, O oh Lord. You are worthy, O oh Christ, of it all. And I pray this in your name, Jesus, you alone, who is worth it and worthy. And we all said, Amen. Amen.